Justin Brierley and Alex O'Connor sat down to have a conversation about the surprising rebirth of belief in God, which is the name of Justin's book and podcast. Atheism, I think this needs to be teased apart. For example, when you said a second ago that studies show that young people are more open to God and spirituality, mm. I'd like to see those teased apart because I, I can find no shortage of people who will say, yeah, you know, I, I don't know if I'm like an atheist because like, how do you like know, you know? So there must be... And a conversation. Justin mentions how young people are more open to God and Alex agrees. But he says the fact that young people are more open to God and spirituality, he would like to see some of those studies and research teased out. That's a fair point. And what do people mean when they say they're more open to God? Uh, the latest studies done by Barna and Pew Research do reveal more of an openness amongst Gen Z when it comes to matters of faith. We've also seen that many who profess Christian beliefs hold to views that are just downright heretical. There's no way around it. A good example of this is the State of Theology's report. It, it showed how, how unbiblical some of those positions truly are, right? Some of these views that some of these people who claim to be Christian, they hold to these just downright heretical views. Now, that's interesting. How much pushback is offered when when talking about a personal God, especially the God of the Bible, but how spirituality is more widely accepted? I think this openness is the point that Justin is making. Not too long ago, anything that was more along the lines of the supernatural was often ridiculed. It was mocked. It was you know, people laughed laughed at it, right? But nowadays, we're seeing more of an uptick, you know, unfortunately, in things such as tarot cards, astrology. And other new age beliefs. So just to work, just so we're clear, I'm not promoting any of this, by the way. I think that these concepts and ideas are harmful and are detrimental ultimately to Christian belief. Awesome. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> that's 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 great. Um, but it 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 is happening in the same sense, you know, hearing people say, look, I'm just seeing people come to church in a way that I've not seen before. If you if you go onto any university campus and speak to professors, what do they say about the sort of shifting tide of the nation? They'll say, gosh, I've never seen anything like this before. Young people are becoming woke. They're becoming super left wing. You know, there are people like protesting speakers who want to come and talk about whether it be something to do with being pro-life or whether it be something to do. I do think that Alex here is guilty of the same thing that he just accused Justin of. This idea that you see this basically because out of line of work that you're in. So this is something he's saying to Justin about the fact that Justin is seeing all these people um, turn into Christianity. You know, he says, oh, this, that's because of the line of work that you're in. But then he turns around and he mentions the uh, the college campuses. Well, the reason you see a lot of that happening at college campuses because of the line of work that they're in. The professors, you know, the <clears throat> university campuses are a, are a ground for these, these kind of ideas, these kind of views. College campuses are more on the liberal side. I don't think that, you know, here in, the, in, the, in America, that's not something that is often debated. It's kind of taken for granted. Now, I personally think this has a lot to do with the professors who are there and the refusal to allow competing worldviews on campus. You know, you don't want to offend anybody, which Alex rightfully points out. Now, I think it's also hard to ignore, particularly here in America, that a lot of the biggest donors to these public universities are often on the liberal side. So the reason for this this shift to, um, particularly here in America, right, when it comes to being woke, has to do with the fact that these donors are already leaning in that direction. They have an agenda that they're trying to push across. Therefore, they're, it is in their best interest to continue this trajectory. Let's add to that the fact that, according to some of the more recent investigations, a good chunk of these larger universities are receiving funds from, let's just say, questionable countries with the nation or whatever it is these people are not christians the, the kind of in fact i think a lot of the um a lot of the essence that underlies that is in many ways anti-christian so it sort of like depends where you're looking as to what you're going to see it depends what room you're in as to what the air is going to smell like you know what i mean and so can i make a quick response to that so I, we're, we're sharing a mic so it's a bit it's a bit yeah do we have a foot does that that is a, before that, you're, you're absolutely like, right. You don't need to hear from there, me. A, I, don't, I don't want you to feel, you know, superfluous. <laughs> there's, there's a kind of selection bias, obviously, with the people I'm meeting right now. Yeah. I'm hosting a podcast called The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, so people are coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> but let's not forget, I also hosted a show where I brought Christians and atheists on sure. for 17 years, and I genuinely have seen a change. The, 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 the way that people talk about God now mm. is not the way they were talking about God 
10, 15 years ago. So something has changed. Do you like, mean certain of that? Do you mean like they're, they're talking differently about belief in God? That is, they're sort of saying like, yeah, no, I, I sort of, you know, I'm not really an atheist anymore in the sense that they are sort of convinced by certain arguments that God's existence. Or do you just mean that they're more, more sort of soft and lukewarm on the sort of social criticism? Because I completely agree with that. People are, people are yeah, much I, less commonly saying religion is this evil, horrible yeah, force that yeah, needs to be deconstructed. I, 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 think, I think the kind of the new atheist rhetoric has dialed down a lot in a lot of people and that's still there, you know, on Facebook, you, you, you'll find <laughs> the, the new atheist sort of stuff coming thick and fast if you mention God in public. But on a, on a more kind of general level, yeah, I just think people are no longer sort of taking that line. But it's, it is more than that. I, I genuinely am meeting more and more people who are saying, well, I was a Richard Dawkins kind of atheist and I've just, I've, I'm now kind of seriously don't, take that approach anymore and i'm i'm really interested in christianity and again i don't have a st hard statistics on this it's just that i wasn't me no alex is pushing back right and, but justin clears up that there has been a change you know in the way that people talk about god in the last 10 to 15 years people seem to be really interested in christianity now this is just a matter of fact at this point right think about some of the recent interviews some of the leading atheists have done they're lamenting the decline of Christianity, even to the point of calling themselves cultural Christians. Now, obviously, right? Richard Dawkins is clear that he does not believe any of this and finds it to be nonsense. But 10 years ago, he was outright claiming Christianity was evil. So we see a progression. There has definitely been a shift. Recently, we saw the conversion of Ion Hersey Ali, which is just unbelievable, all things considered. Now, I would even add to this Sam Harris who has also changed his tune when talking about Christianity. You hear glimpses of this in his conversation with Alex from a few months ago. This doesn't say that, that it's not true. It could be the case that Christianity is true. And that's why when people start throwing it off, they start to feel very disaffected. It's possible. But I still think that the motivation here is less theological than, than we'd like to sort of label it a, a Christian well, well, revival. Let, let me understand this a bit more then, because... What motivation would be this motivation that would validate this this movement in your view? I guess, like I said earlier, people potentially come to faith for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. Very rarely, actually, are they purely intellectual, theological, theologically driven reasons. It's usually because they're experiencing some kind of personal, spiritual, mental crisis. Yeah. And... Um, and yeah, I, I think that's absolutely what is happening in our culture. I think there is this meaning crisis. And a lot of people who are holding on to the hope that the kind of atheist materialist thing might offer some answers have been let down. It feels like that those are empty promises. And so, yeah, I think that's absolutely driving people back to, as you say, a kind of a package. But the package is attractive because it's been proven to work, I think. And that's why people are, are open to it. I, I think that's I think that's an invalid reason for people to to start to investigate. For example, I mean the the book title or the book subtitle "Secular Thinkers Are Considering Christianity Again." In this country, not only is Islam growing faster than Christianity, it's growing and Christianity is shrinking. So I think you know it might be the case that secular atheist materialism isn't really doing it for people. But what that's telling me is that people sort of need to believe in some kind of impenetrable authority that they can refer to when they're confused about what's right and wrong and they don't know where else to turn. Um, also, those moral intuitions that they hold, they want some authority to, to refer to to sort of justify those intuitions. Um, they want a community of people who they can spend time with and, and, and agree with about the way the world is and the way the world should run. Like, sure, people are attracted to that. A bit of a longer clip. This is a real good back and forth between Alex and Justin. Now, I find it a bit odd that Alex is setting guidelines for what should be an acceptable confession of faith and what isn't. I find that odd because Alex is not a Christian. So his position on what should be a valid confession of faith, personally, I would say that's a non-starter. He's outside of the faith. He's outside of Christianity. So his, his perspective here doesn't really hold much weight. I also appreciate how Justin kind of calls him on this, to be, to be honest. I, 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 I appreciated that. It seems that he may be wanting to discredit those conversions that are more on the emotional side. And to be fair, I, I don't wholly disagree with this point, but I think that what is being missed 
is that not all emotions are bad. We would agree that some emotions are good. And even some emotions that maybe start off as not so good potentially could be good things. I love Justin's point here about culture experiencing a meaning crisis. And this is something that I think Christians will be wise to continue exploring. This is something that I think Christians need to investigate and spend more time looking into and researching. Um, there's a lot here. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm an expert because I'm not. But I think this is something that, particularly now with the shift that we're seeing, the question has kind of shifted a bit, right? It's changed. It's not so much, is Christianity true? Now is it's more of a, is Christianity good? So I think taking a both end approach would be very beneficial when trying to defend the faith. Clifford Williams, in his book, Existential Reasons for Belief in God, men mentions non-existential needs, one of those being meaning. Now, here's what he says. We crave meaning. If we do not find it in one enterprise, we look for it in another, sometimes desperately. Now, to be fair, Alex does clarify that none of this will disprove the truth about Christianity or any other religion. His point about Islam growing and Christianity shrinking in the UK is fair, but I think this too showcases how atheism as a worldview falls short, which is what Justin is pointing out. Like, yes, we see a rise in some of these other religions and other and potentially other worldviews, but we're not seeing a rise in atheism as a worldview. I think what we're seeing is that people are saying, hey, this this worldview is unlivable. You, you can't live this way. Now, I've heard some of the arguments that Alex has pushed forward and Sam Harris has pushed forward when it comes to objective morality. Now, Alex does not necessarily agree with this. This is something that Sam Harris pushes forward. But when you dig a little deeper and you press, and I like how Alex presses in that conversation, there's really nothing to ground it on. And, and this is the problem. This is why I think a lot of people who hold to the atheist worldview are starting to walk some of this stuff back. Going back to the whole, you know, Islam is growing. How do people feel about Islam's rapid growth in the UK? When you listen to some of the leading voices there, it seems to be a, a, a growing concern. I agree that people want community. That seems to be something innate to humanity. This is practically true of any group, including atheists. Happening, whether it's a, I think perhaps we could agree on there's a shift in the kinds of conversations happening and the ways in which the conversations are. I, I would also just add that where I've sort of tied this to a political movement that I've said sort of occupies political right, like it's pretty undeniable that there is a, a rise of, of a certain new kind of right-wing politics happening currently. I mean, right now, certainly happening across Europe and, and uh, in the United Kingdom where I'll sort of, I mean, what, what, what a reform UK behind the Tories in the poll, in the latest polls, like one or two points, like that, you know, there's sort of non-negligible chance that Nigel you know might be the leader of the question. opposition. It's... um. It, it shows me that, like, it's it obviously the country is sort of moving more left in the sense that Labour is more popular, but Labour is so popular because they've moved the party right, and the people who are on the right are now sort of considering reform across Europe. The recent elections have shown us that there is some kind of rise of the right wing. So, if enough, I just wanted to add to the to the thesis that if Christianity is sort of loosely tied in this sort of vague a la carte way to like right wing politics, then the rise of right wing politics would also help to explain the rise of cozying up to Christianity. Makes sense. So uh, we'll start with you on this one, Alex. Um, how you understand this sort of shift of the tides, if we can at least call it that, mm. is this something to celebrate or is it not? And then we'll, we'll, we'll go to Justin after that. I suppose it depends on the fruits. Like I've said a moment ago, I sort of started to, I, I started out agreeing with this whole you know, religion is bad. I've realized that saying religion is bad is like saying politics is bad. It's kind of an unthinking statement. It, it's like, yeah, everyone, you say, oh, politics, it causes so many wars. It drives families apart. And throughout history, think of all of the, all of the harm that's been caused by politics. Like, yeah, uh, it's a bit naive because that doesn't exclude the possibility of there being a correct political choice, right? And so I feel like religion is, is or should be considered similarly. So maybe, I mean, I, I, I do like, I, as I said a moment ago, um, the reason that I'm an interesting case, it seems, is because, yeah, I, quite like Christianity. It's got some very nice ethical statements. Some some of them actually quite radical. Famously, the the loving of enemies, I think, is a, is, a, is a genuinely radical moral command that if you genuinely internalize, I think genuinely makes the world a better place, right? So yeah, sure. I, I, would, I would say that it depends on the kind of Christianity because we increasingly hear the term Judeo-Christian as well recently. And if I actually flip open and look at the scriptures, I look at what Jesus said. Most of the time, 
pretty good. I can get behind that. I look at what the Old Testament God was getting up to, and I'm not so much a fan, especially, you know, undertones with our current world conflict when you have stories in the Old Testament of God saying, I'm going to promise you this land, and yes, there may already be inhabitants. We're just going to sort of go in and, and well, let, let's, just, let's just see if they'll leave. And if they don't, then we'll chase them into wilderness and then we'll kill them and then we'll turn around and kill their women and children and their animals too. Um, I'm not so sure. In other words, I don't know. It depends on the kind of Christianity that, that, that springs up because you can just as easily refer to gentle Jesus, meek and mild when you want to make the case that Christianity ought to be this sort of lukewarm, um, laid back, sort of let's all be nice to each other kind of religion. But if there's a political necessity, it's very easy to flip open to other passages too, which say, no, you've got to sort of, you know, take up arms, uh, which has happened historically too. So if the rise of Christianity, if there is such a thing, again, statistically not, but if it, if it does happen in the next 10 years, 20 years, if this does have something to do with the way of the world, that is a political reason, if it does have something to do as I am and, and seemingly people like Douglas and arguably Jordan too, uh, that's sort of implying, then the kind of Christianity that returns might be, as I said before in, at our event at, at Unheard, might be the kind of strong-armed, aggressive, arrogant Christianity that we know has existed historically, and when it has existed historically, we've been quite right to criticize and condemn. So we must be careful. I don't know if it's going to be a good thing. It depends what kind of Christianity emerges. There are as many kinds of Christianities as there are Christians. And so it, it, it's, it's hard to say. It's impossible to say. I just think we should be careful. Perhaps I'm going to pause here. I'm going to jump ahead to kind of Justin's interaction with this question. This is a longer clip. But I think it's it's important to kind of try to hear both sides and kind of hear a, the context of kind of how whether of kind of where they're both going. I think it's helpful. Uh, let me jump forward here a bit. Exactly, we would be celebrating. Um, I think this could go in some troubling directions. You know, if if Alex is correct that this is really a phenomenon that's just about right, you know, right wing political people co opting Christianity for this purpose, then. I don't want that. You know, that's that's that is not what Christianity is about. I happen to think that a lot of the people with the platforms right now talking happen to be right of center for all kinds of reasons. But it's interesting. I do think this spiritual thirst hunger thing is across the board. Uh, so it's just that you don't necessarily hear from people who are more on the left as as frequently as you do from people on the right in that way. But in the conversation we had with Elizabeth Oldfield, um, she talked about the fact that she's engaging with a lot of people across the spectrum who are, who are you know, whatever their political perspectives, they're looking for, they're, they're, they're tired of the materialist account of reality. And it might be that they're into psychedelics and they're looking in that way. It might be they're, you know, that they're, they're, they've got huge environmental concerns and that has kind of triggered their particular kind of search for meaning and purpose because they, they've realized I can't, we can't solve this problem ourselves. We need a spiritual solution. So I think that it is it is more nuanced than perhaps you've described or even than my book describes, because I will absolutely admit the book does tend to major on some of those more sort of high-profile individuals like the Jordan Petersons and the Douglas Murrays and so on. Um, so the question of whether we celebrate this um, is I would only want to celebrate this if it's, in my opinion, true Christianity. And that is the kind of Christianity that absolutely goes to that fundamental command of love your enemies. Um, it is complete. Justin points out, and I think this is something that we should think about. A lot of people, he's talking about the UK here, but I think it also applies here to the States. You hear a lot of people talking about their affinity for Christianity, and it seems to be happening more with those on the, on the right side of the political spectrum. But it is also happening on the left side. Now, why is it that those on the left aren't as willing or as able to be outspoken about this? Well, if we think about some of the stuff that we discussed earlier pertaining, you know, particularly with the college campuses and a lot of these, you know, let's be honest, when we look at businesses and organizations, a lot of them have been leaning left. Perhaps the reason why you don't see those on the left being more willing to speak about their affinity for Christianity is because there could be potential repercussions, right? There could be consequences that would not be good for them, you know, whether it be professionally or perhaps it could impact their ability to provide and care for their families. I'm not saying that's the case, just saying that as, I think that's something that is worth thinking about. This is a longer clip. And I really do, I think this is a really good interaction between Alex and Justin. Now, a lot is said here, but Alex's point about the political right and how that could explain the rise to Christianity 
is valid. We're not going to gloss over that. That's, that's a valid point. But you could also argue the other way around. That the rise of Christianity is creating a shift in the political views. Now, this is concerning, right? And I appreciate how Justin agrees with this as well. I also found it interesting to see the parallels in, you know, the things that happened in the UK and how they are very similar to what happens here in the US. It's almost like they, they kind of go hand in hand, right? Now, one thing that has been real concerning, you know, especially here in America, I'm not too sure about the UK, but one thing that's been really concerning is how many young men are leaning right from a political perspective and how young women are leaning farther and farther left. Now, this creates a problem when it comes to starting families. And we see how this has led to a decline in population. Now, we don't have to look too far, right? We've seen this problem and decline of population in Italy. Uh, we've seen it over in, in China and a lot of these other countries. What happens is, is that the population gets older. There's not enough of young people to care for the elderly, particularly here in the system that's that we have here in America, which will eventually lead to a decline in society. It'll, it'll lead to a decline in how things are functioning, right? You're going to see more and more people struggle, which is not good. So if you haven't already seen, or I haven't seen the whole debate, but I've caught clips, seen clips of it, the debate between Alex and Dinesh D'Souza, it wasn't good. Uh, this is just trying to be trying to be nice, right? It, it wasn't good. Dinesh did not do a good job of defending his position. And honestly, I think it showed that he may be more of a conservative than he is a Christian. You know, Dinesh has been around for a little while and not trying to, you know, belittle the, the what he's done, right? The contributions that he's made. He has had some some good points and he's had some good discussions in the past. One of the things that gets brought up in the debate is this idea of the promised land and what God commanded. This is something that Alex is taking issue with, and he mentions it here. So, so this is kind of why I'm pointing back to the debate. There are really good responses to the objections that Alex makes here and what we've heard other people make in the past You're pertaining to what God commanded. The fact that Dinesh didn't use any of them is telling. The fact that he didn't point to any of these responses, I'm talking about people like uh, Paul Copan and uh, Clay Jones and other and others in this particular area of, you know, discussing the problem of evil and how that plays out with the with the conquest of the promised land. I personally would recommend uh, Gavin Ortland's uh, video, you know, Truth Unites. It's a shorter video where he kind of reviews some of the clips of the debate. He doesn't get super in depth, but he sheds enough light to kind of how this plays out. I would also suggest the uh, the debate that that happened between Gavin, Trent Horn, uh, Kip Davis, and the other guy's first name is Josh. Can I remember his last name? I apologize. But that was a very good conversation and debate between them. And Gavin's shorter video, I think, also shed his light on this topic. Alex goes on to say that he can get behind what Jesus says, but not so much what the Old Testament God has to say. Uh, this is something that is said often, right? They, they make the distinction between Jesus, right? Meek and mild, which I think is sometimes it's, it's uh, overlooked. Like, do you understand what meek means? I'm not saying that Alex doesn't. I'm saying about other people. Alex has done a ton of research. So I'm not trying to discredit his perspective here in, in the least. I think we should remind people, right, that Jesus also said that he did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Also, that he flipped the tables. Right. He flipped the tables in the uh, in the temple because people were being taken advantage of. He didn't like it. It wasn't right. He flipped the tables. I don't know. We, we can't just paint this picture that Jesus is all you know, roses. Uh, we, we have to wrestle with some of the, some of this tension here. When we're, when we're talking here about the conquest. Right. Let me make sure I make this clear. When we're talking here about the conquest, the people in the land were being judged. What were they being judged for? I think that's something that we need to think about. What was happening? And before they were judged, how did they get to this point? You can't just look at this section of scripture without looking at the overall context. I think you have to try to take it in as a whole. And I'm like, I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to sit here and try to unpack it. That's why I'm pointing you to other, you know, resources that are more more capable of explaining the nuances of, of what it is happening. I like how Justin emphasizes that this rise of Christianity is worth celebrating if it is indeed true Christianity, essentially biblical Christianity. 
If it's not that, we shouldn't celebrate it, and we have to call it out. Now, here in the States, we've seen a, a rise of Christian nationalism. Now, I know there's some nuance in how that can be defined, but as a whole, there's things to be concerned about here. You know, when we when you hear some of the things that Doug Wilson says, it, it'll give you pause. Now, later on in the video, Justin mentions a few more popular names who have converted to Christianity, one of those being Tom Holland. Now, if you haven't already, I would strongly recommend reading his book, Dominion. He shows how this idea of human rights derives directly from a Judeo-Christian worldview. There's no way around it. That's, this is where it comes from. And how every society has co-opted this position, this view, without really realizing its origin. A purely emotional conversion in the long run will not be enough, but it can be a starting point, which is what Justin also shows. When trying to make an argument for us as Christians, right? When trying to make an argument for God, I think it is best to take an existential approach and an evidential approach. So more of what they like to call a cumulative approach. Thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time.